Welcome to the sixth episode of the OpenCL video series. My name is Dave Gohara, and I'm with MacResearch.org, as well as with the Center for Computational Biology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. In this episode, we're going to talk about shared memory kernel optimizations, and really what that means is we're going to be uh, sort of bringing home all of the concepts that we've talked about thus far in terms of shared memory, what it's used for, uh, how to take advantage of memory layout, things like that. Um, and so if you've understood what we've talked about in, the, in, in that regard so far, then this should be a, a very simple extension of that and kind of give you a, uh, an example of you know, how it's actually used in practice. If, uh, if you're still having some troubles with the concepts, hopefully this will help solidify them in your mind by actually looking at an example and seeing um, how it makes a difference and that, in fact, it can, uh, using shared memory, can, in fact, make a, a big difference in um, the efficiency with which calculations can run. I'd like to um, oh, and then I also want to point out, of course, that if there are any questions uh, or uh, comments, feel free to uh, either post them to the MacResearch.org forums uh, or by emailing me. My email address is up here on screen and um, letting me know I'll either answer the question directly or I'll try and address it in a future podcast if it's something that uh, a lot of people are asking about. And so with that, uh, I'd like to just do some quick housekeeping. Once again, I'd really like to thank Macius, our hosting provider, uh, for really giving us uh, some great service and for, for really doing a fantastic job uh, uh, for us. Um, if you're looking for application hosting managed services, they're a great group of guys to deal with. The service has been uh, phenomenal. Um, they've really been a pleasure to work with, us, uh, to work with and uh, we appreciate them working with us, and uh, we appreciate their support uh, that they've given to uh, MacResearch.org. So thanks again, guys. Um, since we had the last podcast was all Q&A, there's really no Q&A this time. Um, so let's just get to it. Uh, in this uh, podcast we're gonna again we're gonna do uh, um, you're gonna get be able to download an Xcode project that's derived from some real world code the code example comes from a program called APBS which uh, I work on in my day job and it's used uh, primarily to understand uh, the electrostatic properties of biological bi biologically relevant molecules and uh, the reason why this is important is for, for a number of things but for understanding say protein ligand interactions uh, Drug, uh, drug design, uh, understanding how therapeutic uh, compounds might interact with uh, a molecule of interest um, in molecular dynamics as well, things like that. And so um, the code snippet that you're going to see here is derived from, um, is derived from that code. And um, so you'll see a, a real application and how we've used uh, OpenCL to really increase the performance of one of our computations. Um, this is a, is a really good example because uh, the, the example actually uses um, shared memory to get um, a, a lot of performance. In fact, it's, it's, it's a really good example first because it shows you that you can, um, in, in many cases, you can just take your code, uh, your C code if you have it, and just move it over to the GPU and out of the box get some really great uh, performance. Um, but then it shows you how to take advantage of certain features of the hardware that really allow the code to um, shine and get a lot of performance. Um, performance that you otherwise wouldn't necessarily have access to. And so um, with regards to shared memory, we're going to use this to take advantage of um, accessing the same uh, read-only kind of data over and over again. And shared memory allows us to speed up that process quite a bit. But then this example is also good because it also um, highlights the use of synchronization points and how you communicate between um, work items in a work group and, and, and how you coordinate all of their work and effort um, to do some really sort of amazing things. And so this is, um, this is uh, I, think, I think, a great example for all of these, um, for bringing home all of these kinds of concepts. Now, the calculation that we do is, um, that we're going to talk about here, is um, we do perform in the program a, a complex set of calculations that are broken up into into stages. We're really only going to look at one stage here, and this is the boundary value setup of the problem. And so the the problem that we're generally looking at in our case, we're looking at biological molecules, so we're really talking about atoms. And we have to discretize our problem to a grid. And how we deal with the grid points 
that are internal to the grid are different than how we deal with the grid points on the edge of the grid and or not just the edge the in the faces the, the the boundary of the grid and those the way we treat the uh, calculation on the boundary of the grid is uh, completely different than how we do it internally and so it's very important for us um, to, to a make sure that you know we, we're doing the calculation properly but it's also very computationally expensive how we treat the the, the values on the boundary and so we need to make sure that uh, we're doing this uh, as efficiently as possible now the calculation in this case the way we do it is that uh, for every grid point uh, we're going to be calculating a value over all atoms in our model now I put atoms in quote in this because uh, I don't want people to think that oh you know this what we're talking about here is you know only relevant to this one particular case what we're talking about conceptually um, is applicable to all kinds of problems and so even if you don't deal with biological molecules um, but you deal with you know particle uh, type problems or, or problems that you know uh, can uh, that are conceptually thought of as you know particles or and, or even grids and things like that then um, you know these kinds of concepts will be directly applicable and then of course in this calculation we're also going to show performance between the CPU and the GPU so what are we talking about initially um, here we have um, a, you know a typical molecule of you know small to medium size in this case this is from uh, PDB 2K, 2AKG and it's the G quadruplex from Oxytrichinova. So it's a solution structure that was determined of this um, of this molecule. And the details of the molecule itself aren't important. What's important is that we have a you know a bunch of atoms in this case. And in setting up our boundary value problem, um, we put these atoms you know into a grid. And here I'm just showing the boundaries of the grid but we have you know a grid point here a grid point here a grid point here and we're going to need to calculate the contribution of all of these atoms to each and every grid point and there are a couple ways to do this kind of calculation on a serial machine uh, you can either or actually I'm getting ahead of myself we can either do this from a grid centric approach or from an atom centric approach now in the atom centric approach what we're saying is that um, this atom is going to, you know, calculate the value for this grid point. This atom um, is going to calculate the value for this grid point, and then we're going to iterate over every atom um, and calculate the contributions to every grid point. So this guy would be calculating, you know, this grid point. Then if there was another grid point, it would go on to that one and that one, and then, you know, we do this. Now in a serial calculation, um, the atom-centric approach works just fine. There's there's no problems here because each atom is going to be accessing a grid point, you know, one at, serially, one after the other after the other. In a parallel system, um, this is a not so efficient approach because you can imagine that there will be times when this atom might be accessing this grid point um, but this atom may also be accessing this grid point and this guy might happen to be accessing it and so if they're accessing it modifying the value remember this is a rolling sum um, we're calculating a summation on this grid point of the contribution of every atom to it um, that we end up with uh, this guy might be overwriting the value that this guy just put there. And so what this requires in a parallel environment is that we have to use either locks or reductions. Now on a CPU, uh, reductions can be relatively fast. There's a little bit of overhead to it, but um, doing a sum across an array, you know, we can cache each of these values into their own array and, and whatnot, but uh, that will come at a cost of increased memory. In the case of a lock on a CPU, uh, locks are extremely expensive in a in a in a multi-threaded environment. Um, they're not uh, well. They're they're expensive certainly compared to the size of the calculation that we're doing, and so we want to avoid them. Um, on a on a GPU, we don't have access to locks, and reductions are very inefficient um, to perform anyway. Um, they're, they're possible and I shouldn't say they're very inefficient but it's another kernel call and you can't easily do summations in current uh, GPU hardware across a, a, a bunch of elements um, in, in data that's being you know stored in and out of, of the card. So this isn't necessarily the best approach. Uh, the better approach is to um, do this from the grid-centric um, point of view because every grid point is going to um, 
is going to only be reading data and, and the data we read is the XYZ position of the atom plus its charge and the size of the atom. Okay, That's all read only data. None of that data is getting modified during the course of the calculation. The grid point value is getting modified but um, it just has to know, it just needs to have a snapshot or, or a copy of what the values are for all of these. Now, each grid point you might say, well, you know, that's also a bit, you know, a bit of a problem, but um, since it, it's read only, what we're going to do is we're going to see, we're going to show you how on the GPU grid points can work cooperatively to bring a bunch of data in. So increased performance of doing that. Um, and then they can then access that data very, very quickly do the calculation that they need, and then they can work cooperatively again to bring um, additional data in and do this iteratively. And this, so, the, and and so this is the approach that we're going to take: the grid-centric um, uh, approach to this. And again, the beauty of this is that it doesn't require any locks and it doesn't require any reductions. The, all the grid points, when the calculation is complete, will have been fully updated, and we don't have to worry about one grid point stepping on the value, uh, the, the answer for another grid point, because the value is. Um, each one of the grid points, the value for them can be calculated independent of the other one. And the reason for this will become apparent as you look at the code. And so what is the actual code? So we've taken our problem. It's a, it's a three-dimensional problem, but it's been linearized for um, simplicity. And so basically it's, it's very simple. It's a double loop. For every grid point, we're then going to loop over every atom in our model. And we're going to calculate an expanded version of Coulomb's law. So um, it's just basically um, from each grid point, um, we're going to calculate a distance value, and we're going to offset. Um, the, we're going to do a summation of every atom to uh, that grid point. That that that's it. This is a very very simple calculation. And so, how do we take something like this from the CPU and move it over to the GPU? Well, conceptually, this is very straightforward. The core portion of our code is effectively the same, and our grid um, iteration effectively becomes our ND range. And our ND range is equal to the number of grid points. So if we had uh, 256 grid points, our ND range would be 256. It's it's that simple. And so basically this is what the code in our kernel effectively um, becomes. And so let's look at the kernel code. In this case our unoptimized kernel code would be something like this. We've got a grid value um, based on our global ID. Um, we pull in uh, the grid coordinates because remember we're calculating a distance and we pull in the grid coordinates based on um, our grid ID. Now we could calculate some of this stuff on the fly. Uh, we have uh, plenty of floating point machinery. We, we could do that this way. This is just done for um, uh, simplicity again and, and, and some historical reasons. And uh, once we know that we are just doing our main loop over all of the atoms and then we store the value out once we've once we've done that. So, so each work item, okay, invokes this kernel. Okay, now hopefully what you can see is that there's an inefficiency here and um, the inefficiency comes with the fact that every kernel that would be executed, let's say we have uh, a grid size of 16, so a half warp size, all right, every thread is going to be, uh, every work item, excuse me, is going to be executing at um, atom zero at the exact same time. Okay, So that means that every thread is going to have to read in a value for um, serially is going to read in you know this this value for AX, A, Y, Z. Now they probably won't all read them in. The, the hardware would probably detect that they're reading in the same value. It'll do the load once and then they'll share it sort of among themselves but it, you're then going to be serializing on all of the all of these uh, loads um, for XYZ charge and size, you're going to serialize these when you jump from atom to atom to atom. So as I go from atom 0 to atom 1 to atom 2, those are all going to be loads from global memory and each thread is going to have to wait to service that load. Okay, or wait till that load is serviced before they can continue with the calculation. And so you either have to kick off a whole lot of threads and, and, and flood the pipeline so that you, you overcome these latency issues, which you can do, and this might be something you might want to play with in the code, or um, you have to find some sort of way to uh, bring in this data um, in, in larger swaths 
and uh, do it cooperatively, a bunch of a group of threads, so that they can all access this data as quickly as possible. And so this is where the concept of shared memory comes into play. Okay, so um, shared memory. Um, basically, what I've done for this calculation is I've allocated a shared uh, a chunk of shared memory okay now remember that shared memory um, currently on current hardware you only have 16 kilobytes of shared memory per SM that means that all scalar processors there's eight of them eight cores on an SM have to use that same block of shared memory so you don't inherently get access to the full 16 KB okay but then on top of that um, you want to remember that we don't deal with typically individual bytes of data. We're dealing often with floats or ints or, or things like that. And so really what we get is some actual useful, the number of elements that we can actually, you know, service might be might be less than that. And so you have to you have to keep this in mind when you're um, partitioning your problem and you're coming up with partition sizes, how you how you go about uh, setting this up. But in this case what I've done is I've taken a shared memory block and I've allocated a block that's five times my local size. And in the case of this example my local size is 64 elements. Okay, so I have 5 times 64 times the size of float because I'm dealing with floating point data, okay, which is equal to uh, 1280 bytes. Okay, so I have a block of 1280 bytes that's going to be used per work group. Okay, and each work group is um, again 64 elements wide. Okay. And this will make a little bit more sense in, in a couple slides, the, the, the sort of breakdown. But what I'm saying is that, um, and then what I do with that is I partition that into five groupings. Because remember, I have my X data, which is all linear in memory. My Y data, which is all linear, uh, a stride of one in memory. Z data, my charge data, and my size data. Um, I could have allocated five um, smaller um, shared memory blocks. That's fine. This was just sort of easier. Uh, it just kind of makes the code a little bit uh, more uh, more concise in terms of having to do all the setup and overhead. You know, um, you know what I have to allocate and 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 things like that and variables and and and, and whatnot. So this makes it a little bit simpler. And then what I do is I I, I use offsets um, to index into this data. So. Um, we calculate a local ID. Now, again, my work group is 64 elements. That means that every, uh, uh, that means I have 64 work items in my work group, okay? And each one of those is going to have a local ID between 0 and 63, inclusive, okay? And um, when I want to calculate the value, a value that it's going to need to read, okay, to load the data from global memory, Okay, it's going to be calculated based on some kind of local ID offset. Okay, now that's that's the initial positioning. The local ID we're going to use to to, to index into global data and also to index into um, index into here uh, at at some point when we're when we're copying the data in. And then I'm going to have this other notion of offsets where I add a value to my local ID. So when I want to get to my X data, if I want to get to the first value of my X data, I add zero to it. If I want to get to the first value of my Y data, I take my local, you know, I could take my local ID or an ID value or something like that and add L size to it, which is my local size, which is 64. If I want to get to my Z data, um, I, mul I add in two times the L size, three times the L size, four times the L size. So I'm just calculating a bunch of offsets. This is all very straightforward stuff. If you're familiar with taking a 2D array or something and, and then uh, addressing it, you know, linearly, this is this is the exact same concept. That's what we're doing here. So um, basically, this is how I've done it. Again, there are multiple ways to do this. You could do this. Um, you can do it with an uh, index. You can you can offset set it just by doing some pointer arithmetic once in your kernel, six or one half dozen. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, the, the the compiler will probably um, end up producing the exact same thing anyway. So um, anyway, this is this is how the problem was sort of set up. And so when we look at the optimized code, just the, the, the inner loop, what we do um, is looks a little bit more complicated. It is a little bit more complicated, but it's not 
um, it's not terribly difficult to sort of understand. So the first thing is that we our loop has changed. Our loop structure has changed slightly. Instead of doing in, uh, iterating between over every atom, we iterate over atoms plus equal to L size. Again, this is equal to 64. So we're going to be iterating in groupings of 64, okay? And the reason why this works is first we say if the atom plus, uh, we, we just have this security measure in here, if the atom plus our local size is greater than the total number of atoms that we have, because there's no guarantee that uh, the number of atoms we're going we're gonna to have is going to be a multiple of our local size, then we just adjust the local size. Now I want to point out that there's actually, in this code, there's a bug of sorts, there's a performance bug of sorts, and I'm going to leave it to uh, the viewers to see if they, if you guys can kind of figure out what, what it is and, and what where it's going to crop up, but um, see, see if you can figure out. Maybe you know I'll give uh, the answer next time if I if I um, if I re remember to. But um, there there is something here in here. But um, see see if you can figure it out. And so anyway, so we we just do this catch all just to make sure that everything's okay. And then in the second um, sort of uh, grouping here, what we do is we. Um, just make sure that the, the atom that we're dealing with, we want to make sure that it's less than, you know, the number, you know, when we add in our local ID value that we're less than the number of atoms. By and large, this will be true. And so this is our copy operation. And so basically what we're saying is um, I am, let's say, work item zero in a work group, okay? I'm going to load um, the I atom value um, zero plus my offset. My offset is zero, so I'm going to load in the x value zero, and I'm going to store it into the shared position. I'm going to do the same thing for the y, z, charge, and size. This is all going to effectively get stored into the equivalent of the zero position at each one of these places in shared memory. Okay, and because our shared memory, the way we're breaking it up, is a multiple of is is a power of two or a multiple of a power of two. We don't have to worry about any misalignment or anything like that. Everything will always be aligned in this case. So um, now, what happens if I'm work item um, two? Okay, I'm still going to load in i atom zero, but plus an offset of now two, and that's going to get stored into shared memory location two, shared memory location two plus my L size, so 66, um, two times L size, so 130, et cetera, and so forth. And so what you can see, and you say, well, how is this any more efficient? Remember, the hardware is going to detect that all of these threads are simultaneously accessing data from global memory, um, but they're accessing sequential addresses. And so the hardware is going to say, ah, what do I do in this case? Let me do a full, uh, let me do a full coalesced load into memory. And then we're going to, um, uh, and then this is where we hit our first barrier. So it's going to do these coalesced loads and it's going to hit a, a a barrier. Now you might say, well, why is there a barrier here? Why do I need to have a barrier? So let's talk about that. So I put together a slide. Now, remember, we have 64 work items in our work group, and in this case, it's equal to 64 elements of floats, floating point values, okay? Um, if our shared memory block was just 64, was was um, uh, was of local size, so we had 64, so just for simplicity, okay? Remember, a warp is equal to 32 elements. So if we wanted to service the loads, all of the loads for shared memory, okay, um, equal to this, this size of 64, we'd have to break this into two warps, okay? Two warps are going to have to do this calculation because our work group size is equal to 64. All right. Now, what's going to happen, though, is that there's no guarantee that this warp uh, isn't going to continue doing its calculation before this warp has finished doing its load. Remember, this warp is going to execute something on the scalar processor. This one is going to have to is going to wait or is going to be delayed. No two warps are going to execute at the the same instruction at the same time per se. So they're going to be temporal, temporarily 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 displaced um, 
by at least one instruction, okay? But remember, we also don't service full warps. We service them as half warps, so it gets a little bit more complicated. The first half warp is going to do its load from shared memory. The second half warp is then going to do its load from shared memory, okay, to service this warp. And, and it'll cascade up. So basically what's going to happen is you're going to have four half warps that need to execute just to get 64 elements, just to get our 64 elements loaded for a single instruction. So let's say we're dealing with this line right here. Okay, we're just doing this line here in all of this. This is what has to happen just for that single load. Okay, and so what would happen if this half warp continued, started continuing on with its calculation, or was scheduled to continue on with its calculation before this half warp had finished even loading the shared memory that's going to be needed? Well, the values are going to be wrong. The answers you're going to get will be wrong. And you can do this test. You can, you know, try and comment out the barriers and see if you, you know, always get the right answer. Chances are you probably won't. Um, and so basically what this does is our barrier becomes an implicit block here that says every work item in this work group, all 64 of them, has to get to this step before any work item in this work group can continue to the next stage. This is how we guarantee that all of the data we need has been loaded into shared memory. Once we know all of the data has been loaded into shared memory, then everything within the work group is free to continue. So hopefully that makes sense. So once that happens, then we get to the point where we actually do our calculation and we just iterate over our local size. Again, this is 64. This is the exact same code except now, instead of reading the data from global memory, we're reading it from shared memory. Okay, so we're reading in our read-only atom data from shared memory, and we do this calculation. Now, you might be saying, "Well, wait a minute. Um, if all of these are going to be occurring in lockstep, that is true. So every thread or every work item in uh, a half warp um, or in a work group is going to every every excuse me every work item in a half warp is going to execute each one of these instructions." in lockstep. Now you might be saying if they're all accessing this, is this not a example, would this not result in a bank conflict? They're all reading value zero. And remember, there's one exception to bank conflicts and that's in the case of a broadcast. Remember, if all threads uh, or all work items in a work group are accessing uh, the exact same element uh, from shared, the same location in shared memory, that is a broadcast and that does not count as a bank conflict. So um, we avoid the bank conflicts in all of this. We're just indexing in, we calculate our values, we do this over a loop, and then we wait. So now why do we have a barrier here? Well, again, remember that only, um, that remember that not all of the half warps that are going to be executing are going to be executing simultaneously okay the hardware is going to execute a bunch of them and it's gonna say ah let me just do a context switch over to the other one for one reason or not another something might get stalled something it might be waiting on something else I mean who, who knows why it might do it but it's going to um, it's going to have to context switch at some point and so you can imagine that if the first half warp finishes or the first warp finishes and the second warp is still working on doing its calculation and it were to iterate back over into the loop, you could imagine that um, you'd get into this situation where the sh data in shared memory might start getting overwritten while the previous warp might be writing to it. So an as another exercise, try commenting out this, this barrier, or try commenting them both out and see kind of what happens just to get a feel for how barriers work and why they're necessary. Sometimes it'll make a difference, sometimes it won't. But what you don't want to have is that kind of variability, so it's important that you understand um, this concept. So really this is the code. This is, this is, there's, there's a little bit on top that's not shown here, but this is the core portion of the code. And so what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to Xcode and we'll just do a walk through the project. We'll run the example and I'll, I'll point out a few things and that'll be it. And then um, hopefully you'll have something to, to work with and to, that'll, that'll make things a lot better. So why don't we switch over to Xcode and um, we will uh, and we'll do that part of the demo. Okay, so 
Here we are, we have our Xcode project, and I just want to point out a couple of quick things. In the um, executable portion, uh, last time we had source code, some people had problems running it, and it seems like this was checked, and so what you want is um, this uh, radio button set to uh, project directory. If you do that, it'll find the kernel, and it will run properly from there. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is under the build settings um, for this. It's currently set to 64-bit Intel, so if you have a 32-bit um, Intel CPU, then you'll want to obviously change that. It might auto-detect it. I'm not certain what would happen. I'm using LLVM uh, GCC 4.2. Clang 1.0 doesn't support OpenMP, it seems, so that's why I'm using this, and you'll see where I'm using OpenMP in a second. And then, um, but you could also use GCC 4.2, or if you don't really care about the OpenMP at all, then you can just use, um, you can use Clang 1.0. Um, and then I have OpenMP obviously turned on for OpenMP support, but that's basically it. And then just regular optimizations, I think, were, were enabled to something like minus 03 or something, but it doesn't really matter. Um, for this, be well, I guess it does. Um, you still want you know some optimizations turned on, so that way we're getting a good measure of the scalar performance of the uh, CPU code. So, with that said, um, let's just look at the actual. And then over here, of course, we have OpenCL, the OpenCL framework included. Um, we have our C file, and then we have two kernel files. I, I split this out into two kernel files. I had a valid reason for doing that. Um, initially but it turns out it wasn't really all that valid but I um, was too lazy to put them back together so anyway um, this is this is what I've done so they're split out we have our original version and then the optimized version of the kernel file and uh, let's look at main real quick so we have um, our atoms and our grid points now you'll note that I actually pad the number of grid points out to 512 why 512 well it turns out that our maximum work group size in OpenCL is 512 uh, work items and so Having it be a multiple of 512 is always safe in case you dynamically assign um, a work group size, and you'll see how to do that actually in a in a, in a second. But um, you, so you're always guaranteed to at least be padded. Whatever you need to be padded would be padded out to 512. In in general, it just needs to be a. Um, it's it's ideal for it to be a power of two or a power of or, or a multiple. Yeah, a power of two your total value, um, but you, um, sorry, excuse me, you want it to be a multiple of a power of two, and, um, or at the very least, you want it to be a multiple of a warp size, which in this case is 34, and if you're on AT hard ATI hardware, uh, the size of a wave front, which is 64 elements. So um, I did 512, you know, no harm, no foul. I think that should be fine. We allocate some memory. We generate some data. I was going to include some actual atomic data, but, um, it, it kind of balloons up the download, and so it's not really it's not really worth it. And the actual values that we get out of here are um, terribly important, to be honest with you. So um, we just generate some data, and there's a function that just um, fills up these arrays with random numbers, and then we do our calculation. And so um, we start off with the scalar calculation on the CPU. Um, it's serial, and then we do um, we we do some timing with mock absolute time. And print out the value, uh, print out the, uh, the 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 time for that loop. Um, we do another version of the scalar calculation, but at this time it's actually in parallel. Um, we do using OpenMP, print out the values, and then we do our two uh, GPU calculations, an unoptimized version and an optimized version, and then some cleanup. So let's go up to the top of the file here. Um, Again, just the general uh, utility routines here. There's one that I've included that's not actually turned on in the example. I'll show you where you can turn it on or how to turn it on. And this is called device stats. And this will actually print out a bunch of useful information about your devices. So, you know, if you're running on the CPU or if you're running on the GPU, you can kind of um, call this function for a specific device and it will query the hardware and tell you exactly you know what it's capable of clock frequency the device name extensions that it may support um, etc and so forth so you'll you, you might find that useful so I've included it here as well um, in our uh, kernel this is similar to what we've done before we you know go and then if you want the device stats you can just comment out this line um, right there and then when that program runs it will um, it'll execute that um, 
and, and print out some information to the screen. Uh, we load our program, we create a context, a command queue, um, we uh, do a program. If there's a problem with the program, uh, it'll print out a build log. It'll print out a build log anyway, but the log may be empty. But if something goes wrong during the building, it'll print out and tell you. This is how you can also query to see like if something goes wrong with your kernel file. Because remember, the comp kernel is compiled at runtime, so you don't get any of the um, warnings that you would get like say Xcode gives you if you if you you know if there's a mistake in your actual code and so it's important initially when you're debugging kernels that you might want to print out the build log and this is how you can kind of query it and print out the information we create a kernel for the program called MDH um, and uh, we allocate memory um, for for what we need including our um, including our shared memory, or, or, or the, the, I'm sorry, the, the uh, memory that we're going to write data out to as well. And um, and all of this is, and then we do a CL finish. Now, again, you don't need the CL finish, but we're actually timing these portions of the of the phases. And so we have a CL finish and then mock absolute uh, time calls to, to, um, get, to get that information. And then um, we come in and we set up the actual kernel. Now, here's the important thing is that we have a global work size, which is equal to the number of adjusted grid points. Remember, padded out to a multiple of 512. Our local work size is 64. And uh, remember that the global work size has to be evenly uh, divisible by the uh, local work size. And then we have our shared size. Now, remember, if you go back and look at the, uh, if you look at the slides that it's five times the local work size times the size of float and so this is where we kind of specify what that is but we don't actually allocate any dedicated memory so you'll note up here that we actually de allocate memory on the device and 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 push it out there and and, and do those kinds of things this actually gets allocated dynamically um, by the JIT compiler and then on the device specifically so you don't have to all you have to tell it is how much you want you don't actually have to create it and pass in a handle like you have to do with with these other memory um, with these other memory objects now the, the the question invariably comes up what do I make my local work group size and or my work group size and um, there, a lot of this again is trial and error now there's a way to find out based on your kernel and the device, um, OpenCL can give you a recommendation back on what it thinks is um, a, a good work group size. And um, the recommended size that it'll print out, in this case on my system it prints out for my GTX 285, it prints out a work group size uh, for, this for these kernels of 512. Now, um, what I found is that if I actually use 512, um, A, I can't really use it because there's not enough shared memory, but then also, um, for, again, in the shared memory calculation, but then there's also the issue of it actually it doesn't help the performance at all. And so, um, playing around with this, I um, found 64 to work the best. So that's kind of what I've stuck with um, in these examples. But you can use this to you know maybe dynamically get some idea of what a good uh, work group size is. You would just move this up a little bit higher, and then you could use this to set your local work size, for example, at runtime. So that would be one way to do it. Then we go and we um, uh, enqueue the kernel, and uh, we have our kernel uh, with an ND range of 1, passing our global work size, our local work size. Um, it max actually turns out to be 1, so we're only doing one iteration of this. Uh, it, takes, it takes long enough that um, we can get pretty reliable timings from it. And um, we force a CL finish on the, on the command queue and, um, and then get some additional timings. And then we also read back the data. And then finally what we do is we print out information about uh, how long it took to allocate in queue and then read the information. And then we print the total values. Now, we could run this on the CPU um, in OpenCL and the GPU. You can do that as an experiment if you want. Um, for the CPU code, I'm actually running the, the, the original CPU scalar code. Code, and then I'm using OpenMP uh, just so you can kind of see an example of you know OpenMP and compare and contrast um, how I would parallelize um, this kind of thing using OpenMP which actually just turns out to be this one line of code in OpenMP um, or um, how we do it in OpenCL. Now you might be saying well look at all this work I have to do for OpenCL and look what I have to do for OpenMP. What you're going to find uh, when we run this is that um, although on uh, 16 CPUs uh, the performance is actually quite good uh, compared to um, 
uh, compared to the unoptimized GPU code, uh, it still doesn't compare to the optimized GPU code. And so, you know, it, it definitely becomes worthwhile to pursue these things on GPUs um, until um, we get, you know, 32, 64, 128 core um, type systems. Um, but even then, uh, GPUs may be even, you know, further along. So right now we have 16 um, cores that we're working with on this system. And... Um, this is what we do and so anyway so this is this is basically the project and um, we can go ahead and run this and if we run the calculation um, what's going to happen is you know so it generates its data and then it's going to go and then do the calculation first on the um, uh, first the scalar calculation on the CPU and this takes um, 20 some odd seconds uh, to um, to run so you know it's going it's doing its thing it's running on a single CPU right now and then it'll do um, 16 CPUs and then it'll do uh, the unoptimized GPU and then the optimized GPU and those happen really really fast so um, we'll wait and see so 32 seconds and you can see um, you can see that from the output here. So it took 32 seconds on um, the CPU, and actually it takes about 25 seconds. Uh, I think the screen capture software might be doing something. Uh, I'm not certain, but um, but anyway, we get um, a about 10x speed up on 16 CPUs uh, relative to the 20. I'm using the 25 number because that's what I reliably. Um, get but compared to 32 would be greater than 10x um, and then we look here at the original version of the function so again remember it came out with recommended size of 512 uh, we can look at the time it took and these are values are in seconds so it took 8.8 .8 milliseconds to allocate and push all of that information to the device so pretty fast um, well, slow to a computer, but you know, fast to fast to a human, and it took 1.4 milliseconds to actually read it back. Um, but to actually run the calculation, it took 1.2 seconds. So maybe a little under, you know, uh, two times slower than on 16 CPUs. Um, but it's uh, on uh, on the order of 20 times faster than um, running on a single CPU. So already there, we're getting a huge performance increase over a single CPU. Um, so, so that's actually quite good. Um, and then I also want to point out that the numbers that we're getting back for the accumulated values are identical so far. So the total runtime um, for the GPU loop on Optimize was 2.32 seconds. So it's actually, if you compare it to the CPU loop, um, all the overhead and, and things like that, we're getting, um, you know, there's, it's, it's, maybe it's not a win um, in this case. Or... Again, depending on how you look, if you're queuing a bunch of these kinds of things, it may end up, you know, the overhead diminishes, and so it may end up being a win-win. This is why you want to print out these kinds of statistics. Now, let's look at the optimized version of the kernel. If we look at the optimized version of the kernel, again, recommended size is 512, so that hasn't changed. Re uh, write and read times are, you know, close to the same. These numbers will fluctuate a little bit. But if you look at the runtime, the runtime is 0.125 seconds, so uh, 12, 125 um, milliseconds to run the exact same kernel. So it's 10 times faster than this, and it's about 200 times faster than um, this guy. So that's a pretty big performance when we get the exact same answer again, and um, it's, you know, it's it's really, this is, uh, hopefully will show you, and, and the only difference between this one and this one, of course, is the fact that in this case, the optimized case, um, we're using our shared memory version. That's it. This is the exact same code that was in the um, that was in the in the presentation. So um, that's the only difference between these. And so hopefully uh, you can see that the um, that this you know using the GPU um, and optimizing your code for the GPU is really worthwhile. So with that um, sort of end the demo. You've got this code. Uh, you can download it, play around with it again. Um, I, I do want to point out one thing, um, very, very important, that uh, if you have a system that only has one graphics card in it, be very, very careful when you run these examples because what will appear to happen is that your system will appear may appear to freeze depending on how long it takes for this to run on your system. Okay, So be very, very careful. Your system probably has not frozen, but remember graphics cards cannot be preemptively scheduled.
Um, so uh, our preemptive, there's no preemptive interruption on a graphics card. So if it gets a whole bunch of stuff that it has to run and do, it's going to go and do that, and it's going to wait on, to service any other graphics request until those um, commands are done. And so you may be sitting there, and it'll be like you can't move your mouse, or you might be able to move the mouse, but windows aren't responding or things like that. Um, your system isn't frozen. Uh, your graphics card is just busy. So ideally, you would have two graphics cards in your system, Okay, but if you only have one, what you may want to do is tune tune down these numbers um, substantially, just in case, just to be on the safe side to get that you know until you're comfortable with you know that it's executing and you get some feel for how long it's going to take for these various stages to run, or you might want to. Um, uh, just not run the GPU portion or something like that and just, you know, just look at the code or something like that. But it's better to have two graphics cards. If you have like a MacBook Pro with two graphics cards, you might want to set one uh, one graphics card to um, be the one obviously that displays and then use the second graphics card for OpenCL. And basically what you'd have to do is pull for multiple devices um, instead of one, uh, whichever one OpenCL finds by default perhaps even, um, just switch over, use, use that one for OpenCL. But but then make sure you're actually viewing your screen with the other graphics card. So both of the graphics cards and the newest MacBook Pros and the dual MacBook Pros, uh, uh, dual GPU MacBook Pros uh, are OpenCL capable. One's faster than the other, obviously. But um, anyway, so that's where you would that's where you would do all that. So please do not email me and say, oh no, you know you froze my system or something like that. It's not frozen, but the graphics card will have gotten gotten. Uh, consumed with instructions and if it gets really kind of messed up or confused you may have to force reboot so you really want to avoid that another way to do this is if it's running and the system does seem to get bogged down you could probably still you can still SSH into the system and then you might be able to kill the process and then regain control over the um, regain control over the system but again try to avoid that as much as possible um, but you've been warned so just be careful when you when you um, when you run this. So anyway, um, that's that. We'll switch back to the presentation, finish up, and um, go from there. Okay, so um, hopefully that made um, that makes sense. You, you see, you know, how the projects are set up. Um, you see, obviously, uh, the kernels, um, what's happening in the, you know, sort of various stages, and, and you see the benefit of using shared memory in terms of performance. So um, I really, really hope that this makes things a lot more clear uh, for people if they're having trouble with this um, conceptually. And um, but, but if it doesn't, certainly ask questions, and we'll um, I'll try to address them and try and come up with other examples. But I think this will really sort of drive the concept home for a lot of people. Um, Finally, so what I'd like to end up with is, um, again, all of this information is available on MacResearch.org. You can download the other podcasts if you haven't. You can subscribe to this via iTunes. There's instructions on the website for how to get to this via iTunes. So you can get notifications that way. There's an RSS feed, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, we have an Amazon store, um, so we get a little bit of a small percentage back on any purchase you might make through Amazon if you use buy it through our Amazon store. If there's something that you want to get that's not up there, and let me know, and and, uh, you know, we can just we, – we'll, we'll add it. Um, and you'd really be helping us out. Everything that you buy, you know, comes back and, and helps us, you know, cover costs and, and, and take care of things that we um, – that are – that are that are, you know, we, we couldn't other, do otherwise. Uh, we're not-for-profit, of course, so we don't um, – we don't have you know much revenue, so any, anyway, anything that you can do um, via the Amazon store would be um, through our Amazon store would be a great uh, help to us. It doesn't cost any more if you buy it through our store directly through the Amazon store. The only difference is we get a little bit back. So if you do that, or if you have done it, thanks. We we really appreciate it. And then finally, again, just a reminder: you can go to the Chronos Group website. Uh, they've got all of the they have the OpenCL spec up there. Uh, they've got a little cheat sheet card, um, and then some other information about OpenCL. Great, uh, great resource, great thing to go to. So um, check it out. And uh, that's it. We'll see you next time. I'm not certain just yet what we'll talk about next time. I'm still uh, thinking about it. But if you have uh, questions or suggestions for a podcast, let me know. And uh, we'll try and, I'll try and see what I can do. So until then, uh, have a great week, couple weeks, um, good day, and I'll talk to you soon.